The floor is yours, please. Thank you so much. I have several remarks uh, and several questions. I will reduce them to, to some, only to, to some. First of all, how do you, how, how could you, how could you imagine, you know, the return to the, to the new cooperative model of security between Russia and, uh, and, uh, and let's say the West, let's say the West. Uh, uh, after uh, the current model was, was blown up uh, uh, during uh, the intervention in uh, Donbass and uh, before, uh, during the annexation, illegal annexation of, uh, of Crimea. Crimea. This model that was paradoxically introduced uh, into the NATO's uh, security concept uh, in 2010, but practiced for years, I mean, since the end of the, of the Cold War. The model that was based on an assumption that dialogue is better than confrontation, that it is better to resolve problems together within the institutions that were set up for such, a, such, a, such a decisions. For example, between NATO and Russia, within the NATO-Russia Council. So uh, how could you imagine the, 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 the return you know, to the similar dialogue that was uh, at the basis of uh, the cooperative model of security that doesn't exist anymore? That's first. Secondly, uh, some of, uh, of, of one of speakers, uh, Mr. Malgin, said uh, that uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2018 there will be a chance for personal changes within the administration and within the, ca the cabinet, and that it will uh, and that will lead to, let's say, new uh, mm, new circumstances, political circumstances. Do you think that after such changes, uh, Russian Federation will change the, the approach concerning the conflict in, Don, in, in Don, Don, Donbass, where uh, you have still 30,000 of troops, uh, more than uh, 800 uh, of uh, armored uh, vehicles, uh, and uh, around uh, 390 uh, tanks? And this Donbass is still surrounded, uh, uh, the eastern part of Ukraine is still surrounded by about uh, 80,000 of regular troops of Russian armed forces. So uh, do you think that uh, there will be a withdrawal of, uh, of those troops, uh, of the shadow army, of the shadow army from Donbass? Do you think that uh, there will be changes uh, uh, within, uh, 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 let's say, this uh, area surrounding uh, Donbass, because this is one of the most visible uh, signs of uh, uh, Russian, uh, I will use uh, your uh, word, uh, uh, um, assertive position, assertive, uh, assertive position. And thirdly, uh, one of the speakers uh, was, uh, was talking about uh, about the uh, mm, about the future of uh, of uh, also you were uh, you are speaking about the future of the relationship between the European Union and Russia. Of course, in such a context of 2020 and 35, we can uh, say everything, everything because everything uh, can happen. But uh, there are some uh, uh, crucial differences between uh, the European Union and Russian Federation concerning, uh, let's say, the, the policy, concerning the economic uh, model, concerning, uh, uh, let's say, the, uh, the reference uh, to international global uh, affairs. And there is uh, a huge confrontation right now between uh, the West and, uh, and the Russian Federation and uh, the European Union is a part of, uh, of this uh, West. So how to avoid this confrontation in, f in future and what should be uh, done? I mean, what are the preconditions for such, an, uh, such a 
uh, uh, for such a reduction of tension between the EU and uh, Russian Federation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. How, how shall we manage? We'll collect the, the questions or we will answer one by one. Collect them? Okay, so three questions on Ukraine and EU-Russia relations. I put them down. And then we go to, to you, please. Thank you very much. I'm Charles Dijou. I am a former ambassador to France, and uh, I was also senior foreign policy advisor to Madam President Park. Uh, retired now and uh, uh, welcome this occasion of uh, speaking uh, on this issue. Uh, Russia is part of Europe, you know, a yeah, large chunk of uh, relationship may be done through your relationship with, uh, with, with uh, Europe and United States, but you are also our neighbor. And uh, we have our own uh, initiative and project to link the railway with Russian railway, Trans-Siberian railway, uh, to shorten the distance uh, uh, of the logistics uh, in term, uh, with, uh, with, to connect with Europe, uh, uh, Germany, France, and other countries. So we worked very hard to link the railway uh, in through indirect contact with North Korea, not direct contact. And uh, we are about to sign, finally, the contract uh, in the February two 2015, uh, after 10 years of waiting and patience. Then in January, North Korea blast nucle fifth nuclear bomb testing, so only it uh, uh, went off and uh, we didn't be able to sign. Uh, uh, and uh, at that time, I left the government already, uh, but it was very uh, uh, unfortunate. Then uh, probably the, the uh, even the UN Security Council uh, opt out, you know, the mention on this uh, railway project. So still, uh, it can be it can be done potentially, and um, the new government focused very much also to follow the same pattern of policy. Even though they changed the name, they don't call it Eurasian Initiative, but they set up a Northern Cooperation Committee, which will be more powerful. So I hope they can carry on. And uh, then uh, another co uh, thinking that we have is. Uh, of course, the most backward uh, region in China now becomes the northern three provinces. Uh, three provinces in, you know, three northern provinces. China are the most legal region in China now, because of this blockade by by North Korea. And of course, uh, you know, you, you need to develop Primorsky area. We are ready to also cooperate. Big project was there. Nothing was done practically. But now uh, our people start to you know, travel freely there because there is no visa waiver now. The big change will be there potentially. One of the conclusions I have personally is that uh, we should change mind. Before, already something has to pass through North Korea. But until we find solution of North Korean nuclear problem, we cannot do that. And uh, but Shirut, we can link uh, our Busan port to Vladivostok and Harbin and beyond. Uh, we can start uh, this uh, operation uh, of uh, Trans-Siberian uh, cooperation. So that is the vision. I, I hope the new government will carry on that. And uh, so, uh, you know, my viewpoint is, uh, I, I don't have a feedback also, is that uh, we must uh, have solution, of, find solution of North Korean nuclear problem because that's uh, against the humanity. Now, we don't need any more nuclear weapon state. We must absolutely put an end to that, and we need your cooperation, your permanent members of the Security Council, like France, and uh, I think uh, there's good cooperation. But how to pursue North Korea? You are the best, uh, for the moment, you are the best one who can speak to North Koreans uh, because thank of these tough relations between thank China. Thank you very much. So I hope you uh, comment on that. Mm -hmm. Then also uh, about, I, I see the, the drastic change in Vladivostok area. Already was to become a modern city, very attractive city in terms of tourism and potentially logistic destination area. So I think that, uh, we, in 20 years time, I hope to see a very uh, you know, prosperous region, the Primorsky and the Avarovsk area and the other region. That goes with the parallel development in northern province, three provinces in China, and potentially North Korea, and Korean Peninsula, and Japan will find also source of investment there. I think, uh, lastly, I think uh, the Eastern Economic Forum that uh, President Putin launched two years back uh, will uh, 
will add momentum. A annually, one must revisit the document. Yes. So this should be changed, and I think uh, there will be change. But again, uh, w without even pe pe uh, passing through North Korea, we should do that. But it, it will be far better if we find solution of North Korea nuclear problem. We'll have a uh, uh, you know, gigantic uh, program of helping, help, uh, economic help. Uh, to, we are ready to help massively to North Korean economic build up. But the, now the only you know, precondition is a nuclear problem. So we really hope uh, regional powers cooperate, find solution. But uh, on the other end, even if we don't have that, we must uh, maintain peace. Not have, we don't need to have uh, another war. And we have to start linking uh, your, your port with our port and start you know, shipment to, to Europe and European goods can come to us. So that's my end. Yeah. Thank you very, very okay. much. Okay, uh, let's keep our questions a little shorter because we, 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 not, uh, we don't have enormous amount of time for answers. So please, the, the third question, and that, that, that's the end of the first series of questions. Good. Uh, to Mr. Jenkin, the first question about territory. There is many interpretations that Russia can divide in future, or there is many interpretation that Russia will enlarge. For example, in Central Asia, um, I mean, Kyrgyzstan, the question about relations between Russia and Belarus, which prognosis it's uh, uh, closer to the reality uh, way of develop of situation. The second question to Mr. Malgin about uh, Siberia, um, about, about plan of develop of Siberia in context of, for example, the population, etc., etc. You know very well f f for sure that problems. I think that it should be a key element every prognosis uh, about the future of Russia to, to look for the Siberian problem. And the third question, uh, third question uh, to Mr. Nisovnik about the, what's your, uh, in your opinion, the main barriers in uh, um, uh, growing on uh, population uh, in Russia? What's the main barrier in develop of uh, population? Uh, the question is, in fact, how to stop the depopulation of uh, uh, Russian Federation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I guess there are more questions to Artyom than to others. So probably we'll start with you, Artyom, and then Alexander, and then Yaroslav. OK. Uh, thank you, Grijuric. Uh, and uh, please don't be uh, afraid to interrupt me when you consider me too long in my uh, OK. Um, first about uh, Siberia, because it's easier to answer. Uh, uh, I have no recipe, first of all. Uh, I've uh, never been in Siberia. Uh, the last JRP uh, point or, uh, I was, it was uh, the Urals, and then many times in the very far east. So it's a complete uh, known uh, place to me personally. But what um, I can say uh, that uh, southern Siberia is rather well populated, but it's also the problem of climate. Do find those who are, let's say, ready to go to unfriendly climate. Look and uh, at the next thesis, it's look at the uh, pre-revolutionary Russia. It was much more southwards. The biggest cities at that time were Kiev, Odessa, to, the, to some extent the greatest developments were faced in Yekaterinodar, nowadays Krasnodar, and if not the uh, revolution, I guess it had a chance to be as big as uh, Odessa to some extent. So, uh, but then uh, under the Soviets, because of this resource-led economy, we, and probably not because of uh, the political will, because it was that time of uh, such kind of industrial development, we moved towards 
nose removed to also then Siberia. And I guess it's not the best recipe to populate somehow artificially this uh, region. It's what I can answer upon this question. I guess it could be readdressed to uh, Yaroslav to some extent because, uh, yeah. And then about Ukraine, EU, Russia, and Russia. I'm not going to count figures of the troops, tanks, and all that stuff. Because uh, when we uh, start talking about figures, troops, when it comes to around Ukraine or even uh, Eastern Ukraine, they are absolutely different. But what I, I can say, what I can stress again, uh, the appeasement in Ukraine, to stop conflict in eastern Ukraine, it's a key point to Russia's European policy. It's a key point to better relations with the EU. And it's also a, one of the key points to stable developments in Russia itself. Because uh, the conflict in Donbass touched strongly the development of the Russian regions which neighbor this part of Eastern Ukraine. Look at the statistics, what's happening in uh, Rostov region, at uh, other neighboring region uh, which neighbors Ukraine border. They, to the greatest extent, were interlinked with Ukraine and with uh, Donbass in particular when it comes to very southern parts of uh, European territory. And uh, here I see no other ways as a uh, resolution of the conflict. And I guess it's the best, uh, the, the, the one of the um, mistakes to start approaching with counting troops. We first need to understand that it should be resolved. And then it opens uh, our uh, relations with EU. You know that uh, EU imposes sanctions or continue imposing sanctions every half a year. So we have a chance to a pretext to remove uh, sanctions when we witness better uh, situation in, in Donbass every half a year. Alexander Dinkin. I have one sort of geographical question, uh, so let me start with geography. Let me remind you that uh, I told that Russia is not the country for the beginners. So our border uh, with, uh, say, European states is something like 6,500 kilometers. Our border with Muslim countries is twice as bigger. Our border with China is 4,200, and we even have 17 kilometers border with DPRK is just to imagine where we operate. Um, so I guess there is uh, no intentions to enlarge this territory. It's even huge. So I guess this is fears about Baltic. It's completely political speculation about Belarus and so on and so forth. So this is the first part of the answer. Uh, regarding Ukraine and the relations with European Union, you know, uh, our perception in Moscow was that it was coup d'etat in Kiev and uh, France, uh, Germany, Poland, who signed the transition period with an opposition, did not say a word after happening of this coup d'etat. And President Yanukovych, he was staying for three more days in Ukraine. Nobody supported him. This is about the so-called international, international law. Our policy towards Ukraine was typically Western policy. It was responsibility to protect Russian-speaking population. You know, so all we are mirrored uh, your behavior, I don't know where, everywhere completely. Uh, so um, alternative five facts about overestimation of the troops, uh, you know, recent uh, military drills in the Western part of Russia and Belarus, we follow the statistics in Poland, it's overestimated the quantity of troops involved in these drills 10 times. So this is, this is not, not uh, my problem. Uh, regarding relations with Korea, I do remember this uh, very, I guess, uh, economically valuable project of the railroad towards Pusan, which, with connection with Yokohama, so it could be 
the belt, you know, to Europe, it never happened due to the policy of the North Korean regime. I could not understand that. They maybe they scared influence through this railroad, but it, it never happens. Uh, regarding solving the nuclear problem, I guess its uh, military solution would destroy the Seoul completely. This is my point. So I guess something like Iran deal with uh, North Korea is the only one recipe how, how to manage it. But there is plenty of um, uh, other options. Uh, regarding Donbass, you know, uh, approximately months ago, President Putin suggested to use peacekeepers on the dividing line. And in my perception, this is a breakthrough for the solution of the Donbass issue. Currently, a Russian project of the UN resolution is in uh, New York and United Nations debated, and we shall see what would be the Western response to those ideas. I guess it's idea completely workable. And Yaroslav, please. So very briefly on Siberia, uh, I think uh, if you were to ask me what are my top picks in terms of uh, regional centers and the regions that are to grow in the coming decades, I would say it's the Far East, as rightly was pointed out by uh, the Korean representative here. Uh, clearly there's a lot of interest from foreign investors. Uh, and uh, I think we are seeing developments, important developments with regard to building scientific centers, et cetera. And then uh, southern Russia, including regions of Krasnodarsky Krai. Um, I think uh, the paradigm of regional development that we saw during all of the Soviet period and, in the, and partly in the post-Soviet period, of hinterland regions being developed more compared to the seashore regions, um, uh, this is going to be reversed. Um, and Russia is going to be more in line with international practice whereby um, it is going to be the coastal regions that are going to be growing uh, much faster. And I can tell you, if you look at the share of the budget that is distributed from the federal center to the regions, the highest shares are the Far East and Southern Russia. So clearly, in terms of state priorities, these are the two regions. Uh, Siberia, I think, uh, will continue to be, to a significant degree, a um, repository of uh, natural resources, which uh, has been its traditional role. But then, uh, of course, another important issue is human capital development, and there are parts of Siberia that are very important in this regard, including the uh, Novosibirsk region. So um, I think um, uh, to, to a significant degree, the role that has been played by Siberia will, um, will continue. But in terms of growth um, and in terms of priorities, it's going to be the Far East especially, I think. In terms of uh, demographics and what are the recipes to deal with uh, adverse demographics, um, well, it's uh, targeting human capital development and budget spending that is oriented more as a share of total spending towards uh, financing health care. Um, we in Russia um, had a program that was very successful that uh, um, directed additional uh, monetary transfers to th those families that had a second child. That served to boost uh, fertility rates. And then I think under discussion, I'm not sure, but I think there are discussions of the possibility to expand this program to families that have a third child. Um, and then uh, if you take uh, the past several years, the average life expectancy um, has um, increased uh, substantially and is now above 70 years. It's roughly around 71 years. Uh, for males, this is 67 to 60 years uh, old. Um, to remind you, in the 1990s, the average life expectancy of a Russian male went as low at one point as 54. So clearly, the developments of the past several decades uh, in that regard are positive. But the main conclusion from our history, especially from the 1990s in terms of demographics, is that the best thing, uh, the most important recipe for these things is stability, economic stability and economic growth. Uh, the experience of the 1990s was a tremendous fall uh, in uh, 
uh, population, uh, both uh, well w with regard to fertility and significantly higher mortality. And uh, part of the reason uh, was uh, simply economic instability. Thank you very much. Another round of three. Yours, Sean Cleary, and our Consul General. But Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Jankovic. I was a former member of the Austrian government and Austrian diplomacy, and uh, now work for the Austro-French Center for Rapprochement in Europe. So this is a very interesting discussion for me. And my question relates uh, to uh, a very unstable region of Europe, namely the Western Balkans. And uh, President Putin once said that um, the um, the uh, demise of the Soviet Union was one of the great catastrophes of the 20th century. Uh, I also believe personally, at least, that the dissolution of Yugoslavia, the disappearance of a country which provided stability uh, and had a very uh, important role in international relations, is a similar catastrophe. So it created a lot of instability in the region. And the only organization which at the moment in Europe is capable of bringing some degree of stability and uh, continuity into this region is, want, like it or not, the European Union. Uh, two of these countries have already joined the Euro European Union, Croatia and Slovenia, but uh, there are four more. And uh, I have a little question in my mind uh, how, Russia, the, how the Russian Federation sees this process of integration of these countries into the European Union, which is not in any, any way anti-Russian. Some of these countries, like Serbia, have a long and very uh, prosper and a, and a very close relationship to Russia. Uh, all of them are Slavic, and uh, but a certain uh, uh, certain um, shall we say um, overtures made from time to time to the Rubrica, Republika Srpska in Bosnia from from, from Russians and. Uh, lakes, uh, uh, raises question whether or not uh, Russia is behind this process, and I think this would be something which would be very stabilizing for the region and would also certainly help to improve the relations between the European Union and Russian Federation if uh, the note, uh, a shadow of a doubt would, would exist that there is no opposition uh, to this joining from, from Russia. And on a purely personal remark to Mr. Panov, I would like to say, you know, I've always defended the idea that Russia is a profoundly European country, and I don't really see, uh, out of this philosophical, and someone mentioned Dostoevsky, how you can join with China. But that's just my personal remark. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're not alone. Um, Sean Cleary, please. Forgive me for this, but it's a, it's a philosophical statement about... Future World Foundation is about philosophy. And, so. you're well, leading this <laughs> and you're leading this think tank. Thank you. Thank you. But it, it, it's related to the topic. It's about <coughs> Russia in 20 years. Now, when one does any form of scenario work, you usually have two questions that you have to ask right at the beginning. Are you going to look at a set of drivers and a set of uncertainties and then plot the interrelationships between these? Are you therefore going to take an analytical approach in respect of the development of scenarios? Or are you intending to create normative scenarios in order to justify an outcome that you perceive to be appropriate? Now, both of these are legitimate uses of scenario method, and both of them, I would suggest, are appropriate ways to tackle the question of Russia in 2020. So my question, but if you'll allow me, I want to tag a comment onto it, but my question is, in approaching this question, how much was normative and how much was analytical? Michelle, I think yours was normative, I think. But the, the key question is, what are we trying to do? The second tag comment on it is that, quite frankly, we are at probably the most dangerous period, certainly, of my comparatively short life. Seven decades is not a huge amount of time. But we are at a point where the rules of the game are being questioned on almost every front. International law has been questioned in terms of both its efficacy and its legitimacy. 
most geostrategists I've, over the last 30 years, I suppose, have tended to argue that stable and progressive situations can only be defined if there is a reasonable equilibrium underpinned by a normative regime that enjoys legitimacy and permits efficacy. Arguably, that isn't true today. Now, the problem is, when it isn't true, then you get the sort of situations that we've seen too often in the past. We certainly saw it in the years leading up to the First World War. One doesn't have to buy Christopher Clarke's thesis of sleepwalking into disaster in order to be able to argue coherently that it was an absence of an ability to envision, envision better outcomes and a coherent strategic approach among the great powers of the time that led us into an absolute disaster. One could make the same case in respect of the 30s leading up to the Second World War. We don't want that today. But there's a very great risk if those in Moscow envisioning Russia in 20 years' time, and those in Washington, characterized by tweeting and, frankly, indecent behavior, and those in Europe fractured as a result of uncertainty due to rising populism and the like, and those in China determined because of a failure of everyone else in the system, to try to bring some order through frames of global governance, are all acting on independent tracks, there's a very great risk that a funny little man sitting in Pyongyang, or one of half a dozen other events, could in fact lurch us into something that we'll all regret deeply for the rest of our lives. So the question really is, do you have a vision of where Russia should be in 20 years' time? And can one start constructing a strategy that will enable one to achieve that outcome in a manner that is consistent with the positions that other major actors will be adopting over that period? Thank you very much, John. We discussed it many times over. We are in the process of building up something like normative uh, vision of global governance with Sean and with his people. And uh, I would uh, dare to try, when I make a conclusion, to answer your question from my personal point of view. I thank you very much for your question. And he, our Consul General of Russia in, in uh, Casablanca, please. Uh, thank you. I'm not in the business of uh, uh, entertaining any questions here. It's not my role and purpose. Uh, I want, wanted to uh, resort to an allegation made, uh, and uh, we're not talking numbers of troops. There are no Russian troops in uh, Donbass, period. Okay. The <laughs> remark is well taken care of. Thank you very much. So there were three questions. Uh, no. Two questions and one, uh, uh, one uh, dec declaration, put it this way. So uh, question number one is on the Western Balkans and uh, what's our role, what's our position on their integration into the EU? Who wants to, to answer? Please, sure. Just to, yeah. oh. <laughs> Uh, here, Jurgen's commented that uh, he provides uh, the path to uh, the young. Uh, look, they in Austria have really young people at the top. Yeah, that is providing path and track to, 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 to the youth. Okay, uh, look, uh, what I, I, I said it uh, in my speech, and I always stress it when I in the Western audiences, when we talk whether Russia, whether Russia want to support being against or something like this. Look, Russian elite, if it's not, let's say, uh, a sh uh, really strategic issue and taken in a short period, very much, uh, I won't use word, div divided, diversified. And the Balkans, 
as well as many other international issues, it's such a point of discussions. Not as strong as Ukraine, because when it comes to uh, Ukraine, there are many other points of view. And I, for example, belong to a rather moderate one. And as for the Balkans, there are those who are really involved into the Balkan affairs. Those who understand differences between these small uh, quasi states um, in the Balkans, they could have their interests in. But strategically, Balkans are rather far from us. And it's clear that through these 25, 27 years of the post Soviet period, we have not managed to wage a specific uh, long standing logic strategic line there, because the region is very much diversified. To know everything, to coordinate, to uh, put together all these minor trends, it's impossible. And I guess now uh, I participated in a number of uh, recently organized official, semi-official discussion on the Balkans, I'm, I'm not a specialist on the Balkans. Uh, and the general trend, I can say, just to let them on their own. It's clearly, because we have no, let's say, immediate interest of let them into the UA or stop being, uh, <coughs> stopping from this. And I guess if it's the general trend in the Balkans, it's, and it's uh, the general trend, in spite, uh, in spite of what uh, our Albanian friend yesterday said that uh, for him, EU looks a little bit ill man of Europe. Look at, at him, look at his own country. Yeah? And uh, it's much more robust than Albania, I guess. So uh, if it's a general line, we'll follow the general line. And when they are in EU, we'll set another portion of our interests in a new framework of the Western Balkans being inside the EU. It's the answer. Just, just a question on that. The uh, Albanian Prime Minister and also Mr. Djukanovic, uh, Prime Minister of Montenegro, said that uh, there was a Russian uh, military attempt to overthrow him. Um, um, is it true or not? Because they wanted to, they Excuse wanted the uh, point of order. Because first, Mr. Lisavoli right. wants Montenegro. To yeah, the, the Djukanovic is the no, uh, no. Djukano what Djukanovic actually said that there were Russian nationalists who are persecuted by Russian authorities, including National Security Council, and those Russian nationalists, which had nothing to do with, they tried two of them, two of them. To, they tried to do something in Montenegro before Montenegro uh, has elections, which would be historical, joining then probably NATO, which they did. So uh, I don't think that Russian authorities has anything to do with the radicals who are now today, today in Moscow, are being locked up in prison for uh, demonstration which was not allowed by the state. But uh, excuse me for, for interruption. Uh, Yaroslav wanted to answer the, the, que the previous briefly, question. Uh, uh, Serbia is uh, actually uh, uh, talking about um, not just uh, a one-way uh, vector in terms of its uh, development of partnerships towards the EU, but uh, it's actually negotiating um, and discussing the possibility of an FTA, a free trade area with the Eurasian Economic Union. So I would actually turn the question to you back. Would Europe, would the EU accept the possibility of an economic alliance between the Eurasian Economic Union and Serbia. And by the way, as you probably know, uh, there are no full-fledged relations between uh, the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union. There is no full-fledged consultation. So um, I, I actually see um, you know, some issues in terms of how uh, this process uh, needs to be approached. It should not be approached as a one-way street. Um, this is a country that has substantial support for Russia, substantial inclination for economic building, economic relations with Russia, and it should be allowed to choose its own path 
and if it's a two vector um, uh, kind of model with the possibility of alliances both to the west and to the east, let it be so. But, um, um, you know, uh, the, the Serbs are talking about um, Serbia as, as a bridge between, between the, the Eurasian Union and the European Union. I think that would be a very good model that could be perhaps replicated for some of the other similar cases that are called in between countries, between those between uh, the European Union and the Eurasian Union. Uh, thank you very much. Before we wrap up and give a, a short uh, uh, final remarks to all participants of the panel, uh, can Russians allow me to try to venture to answer Sean's Cleary's uh, question? If so, then uh, Sean, by wrapping up the discussion of today, he, he, here is the main outcomes. There probably would be a bipolar world. United States, European Union on one side, uh, Japan and other allies, and uh, China, Russia, India, probably, and some other countries on the other side, which is basically uh, the, ch the, the, the two uh, polars united by the different system of governance, one democratic, another autocratic. Uh, if this is so, uh, and we're, now we're talking about Russia. Uh, from the analysis given by Alexander Dinkin, uh, which is Argentization of Russia, I remind you that Argentina was the fifth largest nation after the Second World War, now it's 65 or something. Argentization because our uh, human capital, investment capital, and technology plus demography doesn't allow us in this mo linear model of uh, Alexander Dinkin, not only of his, uh, develop f uh, faster than 2%, probably three. This 2% is identical to 3% of the European Union and, and even a little less than the United States at the moment. That means that we're lagging behind and in 30 years time, we are Argentina of today. From the, but we cannot allow it, first of all, because of the national pride, genetic code and everything else, Plus, we control the territory, which definitely will be a uh, 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 very big interest from the neighboring nations. We cannot allow ourselves, from the military point of view, to become Argentina because we will just explode. So that's not a, a chance for us. S second in command to China, I don't think that Russian character would ever tolerate that. Uh, uh, nobody among my friends know a single Chinese song, verse, or even watch the movie. And everybody knows Beatles and, and, and Humperdinck and uh, wh whoever, Drodassin, okay? So it will take not one generation to make us Chinese and to say that, you know, we will be second in command to China when we didn't agree to be second in command to the European Union on the United States. For me, it's very hard to visualize. So what's left? One polar, China and the autocracies, which we can temporarily join. Another polar, democracies, which will develop with its own difficulties. What's, what's in future for the world, which becoming larger in terms of population and smaller in terms of resource? I guess the only viable theory is that's what uh, Sakharov, uh, <coughs> name it on, on your side, was aspiring for, which is conversion of two models, which China tried to do at the moment by uh, installing very serious social conditions on its own systems, but enhancing efficiency. So the combination of social justice, the way it declared, had to be uh, numerically and what not uh, normatized, and economic efficiency brings us together on these two polars. They will develop in, uh, I agree that probably in 20 years it will be bipolar, but to survive they had to come together. To come together, they, that can be only on the basis of some kind uh, of conversion, which Stiglitz on one hand and, and uh, uh, Sakharov on the other was, was aspiring for. So one happy multipolar world 
with some drastic cut on wealth disparity, which you were uh, alluding to. Uh, the mathematical models, which uh, both in terms of norms and in terms of anal analysis will bring us together, that's the only way out. It's, 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 it's too difficult now to visualize, but there, I don't think that if we have to, we have to survive, uh, uh, we have uh, any other uh, chance to do. Uh, I'm being a little bit, uh, how should I say, even more hypothetical than some of, uh, some of others. But uh, uh, you know that we submitted to the World Future Foundation uh, our views on that, and I think that this uh, peaceful conversion of two systems uh, probably is the best chance for, for Russian Federation. Otherwise, we will be torn apart by uh, European Union on the one hand, and bigger Europe, and, and Asia and China on the, on the other. Uh, please, any of the uh, participants, o all of them have, I will tell you how much. Th no, two, yeah. mi two minutes each to well, repeat. Two minutes each, well that's very good. Well no, I've, I've enjoyed listening to the conversation, but I'm <clears throat> attracted to uh, Sean's point, what, what do you envisage with the, for Russia in 20 years? Well, we seem to get off that with a lot of, lot of which is easy, easily happens, but, but I mean, I see uh, Russia building on its, on its extraordinary comparative advantages, which it still has primarily human capital, supported by enormous resources. And we talked about Korea, which I, where I spent a lot of time, we have our Korean here with us. Uh, Korea didn't have any resources. The only natural resources that Korea had were up here. And North Korea actually has more resources than South Korea. And look, what, look what, what South Korea has been able to accomplish, which takes you into the other part of the model, which was education. The Koreans, uh, for centuries, have put a very, very high value in education. And it's not the Shabals. I don't think that that necessarily is, is you know, they, we've, there are a lot of difficulties. There. So I, when, when President Putin says he's interested in the Korean model, I hope he's thinking about the education model. <coughs> And I also hope that he's thinking about how important uh, the fact is that with these resources behind it, how well placed uh, Russia is to, to make really serious strides ahead. These relationships, is, at one point I wanted to ask you about though, Mr. Chair, we never heard the One Belt, One Road project, which is the largest, uh, probably the largest infrastructure project in the history of man, which the Chinese have floated. And I know Russia's, I think President Putin actually went to, uh, to Beijing for an announcement in that regard. And I went there, I went there uh, as well to, to try and understand more about what this is. But it's massive, and it's got to have major implications for you and the Eurasian countries. I mean, there's something like 97 airports and how many ports and roads and pipelines. And, and this is seen by many as basically putting it to the Americans to you know, basically bring the trade. You were talking about the, somebody was talking about the, the railway through Busan. I think you were, the, which would, but that, North Korea stands in the way of that. And uh, Busan looks like it might suffer through this project because it's not in the picture. But we didn't hear anything about it here today. And I, I would think that that's got to be some sort of glue between, between economic interests in, in China and Russia. It's so massive. Thank you very much. Uh, Michel. Um, <clears throat> two points on, on international law, I agree. Western country broke the law in Iraq, in Libya, and in Kosovo. I was in charge of Kosovo in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we were not strong enough to oppose um, um, US Department and, and the Pentagon. Uh, we were proposing substantial autonomy, but without a US military base near Pristina because we were not informed of that project. Uh, so I fully agree. It's not a reason to put everything out and to rebuild rule because I don't want to live under the leadership of uh, the people in Beijing. I'm a Democrat, okay? So I'm not sure it's so interesting. Ukraine, um, uh, EU is deeply divided on that. And uh, the uh, issue started much before uh, Donbass issue. Uh, it started in 2008 with Bucharest summit, yeah? with the sentence because France and Germany were against 
accession but Madame Merkel wrote during the night a sentence on open door policy. And this was interpreted very badly by the president in Moscow. And I agree with our term, this is really the priority, how to provide appeasement. President Macron is working on that. I think the Merkel factor <coughs> does exist. Uh, you f will find a, a very nice analysis in the New York Times, um, which is a comparison uh, between two trajectories starting in former East Germany. Mm -hmm. This is a starting point. Somebody in Dresden <laughs> and somebody, uh, the daughter of a pastor. She has a very moral view of realities. In, means, uh, in Normandy format, it's not always easy to, uh, our Polish, Polish colleague he, he left, but of course there is a Polish factor and an American one in uh, Ukraine and crisis. I, my view is we have, we share a burden which is a co-responsibility for the crisis. Uh, it's, um, I always thought that it was unacceptable for Russia to have a scenario of NATO in Ukraine. This is a provocation. That's why I came back to neutrality. But we should have proposed that at the beginning. And when I talked to my colleagues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I was not there anymore. So the answer was yes. We are ready to propose that, but what do we get in exchange from Moscow? You know, so I think we have to work much more to uh, look for appeasement. We have to work in the EU to have um, a common view because our Polish colleagues are very offensive, by the way. They dislike very much Obama pivot to Asia. They wanted troops on the ground, boots on the ground. They got that. But they are offensive. They are very offensive. And you have from Italy to Poland, you know, a, a full spectrum of different positions. So we, I think we should really, it's a priority, and we, <coughs> we should avoid to live with a frozen conflict. If we do that, we will fail. Thank you very much, Michel. Yeah. So the, the time is running short, so Russians who are predominant in the discussion, they have one minute each instead of uh, two minutes for our colleagues from Canada and France. Uh, uh, Mr. Pano. Uh, well, I agree that we are Europeans, but uh, it's interesting that Europeans uh, don't listen to us and don't understand us, but in the Eastern uh, countries. It's better understanding and better uh, really treatment of Russia. And I would like to say, of course, uh, we will never be Chinese as we never will be Germans. Uh, but uh, at the same time, now at our institute, the biggest groups, many groups, are students who are studying Chinese, not French. No, 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 no. You no, see, no, 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 no. The Russian diplomats cannot agree on, on, even on that one. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Dinkin, please. Um, look, regarding this bipolarity, uh, we produce a joint study together with Atlantic Council with um, uh, their part which deals with the foresight analysis and this team produced Global Trends, famous report, very popular around the globe. So we joined our efforts and we produced five analytical scenarios. Polycentric, Greater Eurasia, something else, and among them was new bipolarity. And we published it two years ago, both in English and in Russian. And this is not my fault that the developments of the uh, global order moves, unfortunately, towards this new bipolarity scenario, which was just one of the uh, 
uh, possible outcome after the demise of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, regarding this arrogant, funny little man in Beijing, uh, he's also learning something. He Be learned Beijing on the or Kenyan, Kenyan, sorry. Kenyan, uh? Uh, he learned on the case of uh, Colonel Gaddafi, who received no flight zone. Then he was wounded by his two legs and then brutally killed. And before that, he got rid of his nuclear program. So this young guy learned these lessons. And we counted at my institute that he put that North Korea is a nuclear state in just 100 days after the death of Gaddafi. So for him, this is a salvation, you know? So we have to look at behavior of those countries who engineered Libya, I guess, a little bit more closer. Igor, I am not saying about Argentinization, I just mentioned that Brazil and Mexico, there is our competitors in terms of quality of institution, quality that, that's of not regulation. You. It, it wasn't me who was saying that. It was okay. not, you are much, much more suave. Okay, uh, Artyom. Uh, unfortunately, we have no time to discuss uh, Time to discuss. Ukraine. Please, you just react but, and that's it. But uh, Ukraine, to my mind, is a uh, key point for the next uh, three, four years. Uh, it should be uh, treated in a way as though we have 50%, let us say, of the conflict resolution resources in Moscow and 50 somewhere outside Moscow divided to 25 in Kyiv itself and 25 in the West. Uh, and uh, at the same time, Ukraine should not overshadow other issues if we propel uh, and if we move ahead uh, with other uh, things in our Russia EU relations, uh, Ukraine situation will be resolved in a smoother and in a faster way. Thank like you very much. I like you 50%. Yeah. Everybody starts to like everybody. That, that's, that's very good. Okay. Yaroslav. Uh, on the on well, the question you actually asked uh, in the in the very beginning when I was about to speak or whether Russia is to be the master of the Eurasian universe, Eurasian uh, space, um, I think um, the role of the Eurasian Union will uh, will grow, um, and uh, I think it's very important that the European Union works uh, together with the Eurasian Union. After all. Uh, it is very important to realize for European friends and colleagues that the Eurasian Union was conceived um, as, uh, as one that is based on the values of the European Union, and it was inspired to a significant degree by the success of the European Union. So the negation of the Eurasian Union, I think, is a bit of a self-negation for, uh, for the Europeans. And lastly, I think it's great that we have this discussion on long-term issues. I think even parts of our discussion, which at times were short-termistic, show that Russia is very much lacking this long-term focus. Thank you, Yaroslav. You wanted to have something to say? No, I just wanted to, just about what uh, Michel said, about um, when a diplomatic conference, I think, um, we missed a huge opportunity uh, in this uh, February 2014 crisis in Ukraine. On the 19th of February, um, Hollande and Merkel were in Paris, sent um, the foreign ministers to Kiev. They arrived on uh, Thursday 20th in Kiev. They took uh, Sikorsky of Poland on, on the way and they start negotiating with Yanukovych. The fact that they started negotiating stopped the killing. This is very important. No more killing in the afternoon of the 20th in uh, Kiev. They negotiate all night long. At 7.30 they're tired, they go to sleep. One o'clock Sikorsky wakes up, goes to Maidan, say you should accept it, you will never have a better deal. And then at five o'clock, at, um, at the afternoon, they sign a deal. So I'm watching BBC News, and I see pro-Russian President Yanukovych shaking hands with Terenbok, um, Yatsenyuk, and Klitschko. It's a huge diplomatic success, huge. And this agreement 
which is also just looked by looking by this agreement as three um, para godfathers, France, Germany, and Poland. It's a huge success. They shake hands. There is a political agreement in Ukraine. Then we, the Westerners, forgot the lessons of great Kissinger, where you have such a miracle baby. You babysit him. You just, you don't live the baby in the snow. You babysit him. It's a, mar it's a, it's a, it's a kind of diplomatic miracle. And the basic, and it will, it will be taught in diplomatic academies. And you know, I see like Gimo people here. What would have been the, the basic ref uh, reflex of good diplomats, and Fabius, unfortunately, was a very bad diplomat, to take this, it's called a um, mobile phone. Excuse and, me, excuse yeah. me, there is some time limit because Yeah, just, okay, just finish my sentence, if, if, okay. Sorry, yeah. uh, and, and to ask to see Putin, and to ask Putin to, um, to be also godfather of this agreement, S telling him, Sebastopol will always be yours, NATO will not take Ukraine, and remember Vladimir, in April Please, 2008. Please, we, we, we're we, really okay. short of time. And number three, Russian. I think that we missed, okay, maybe you're not interested, but I think it's quite interesting in the no, relations between the West and the East. it's very interesting discussion yeah, we can yeah. carry on during yeah, dinner. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. But I think that here we missed a great opportunity. Just my point. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody who participated. We have to change.